In 1971, a running back from Cornell University smashed all collegiate rushing records. His name was Ed Marinaro, and he is perhaps best known for his outspoken displeasure at having failed to win the Heisman Trophy that year. I think I deserve the Heisman Trophy, but two weeks after the Heisman was awarded, you know, I was over it, you know. Right now, the past is not really important. I don't even think about it anymore. I don't even think about what I did in college because it doesn't mean anything. In spite of his highly publicized self-acclaim as the nation's finest football player, when the NFL draft was completed, Marinero was once again a second choice. From the Ivy League to the NFL is quite a step. And Ed Marinaro would have more than most to prove to his new Minnesota Viking teammates, who would, upon his arrival, christen him Avis. Even the guys on the team don't remember who was drafted 13th, 14th, or 15th, but they always remember who was 1, 2, 3. So we naturally take the most abuse. They were calling me Avis and, and expecting me to be real, really cocky and, and uh, uh, walk in like I'm going to uh, take over the place. I've gotten used to it. I probably took more abuse than anybody in camp, so you just sit there and say, well, everybody else had to take it, so I might as well. I'm no different. And so the once fabled number 44 became a rather obscure number 49, whose uneasy task was to avoid the controversy of his reputation while nevertheless capturing the coach's eye. In the first inter-squad game, the rookie got his chance. I need something like a, a good scrimmage or just a good night to, to to bring up my confidence. I know if I don't do well tonight, I, I won't be able to live with myself. I'll be ready to go tonight. And sure enough, the pop-off kid from Cornell showed he came to play. In the end, number 49 bore the unmistakable look of a man who had successfully passed a difficult trial. Ed Marinaro was beginning to look less like a star and more like a Viking. But the Ed Marinaro story is only one of the countless vignettes that make up a colorful mosaic of NFL lore. The mosaic pictures tales of sacrifice and struggle that lead to an NFL uniform. Once there, the rewards are bountiful, but perhaps none is more so than knowing the camaraderie of a 40-man team. Who can help but envy the spirit that carries these men in their weekly trials? Theirs is a world of immediate outcome and reward. And what better moments are there than the rough and tumble times of victory? This is a film about such men, their personal trials and eventual triumphs. Ironically, winning the Heisman Trophy is no guarantee to professional success. After a record-shattering college career at mighty Oklahoma, Steve Owens won the Heisman Trophy, but he realized that it was not a passport to stardom in the NFL. I've always been a believer that the Heisman Trophy is given for what he attains in college football. I don't care if you're a Heisman Trophy winner or a one draft choice or a 17-round draft choice, you have to still go in and prove yourself in professional football. So it didn't disturb Owens that he was the 19th player drafted, the number one pick of the Detroit Lions. He only wanted a chance to prove his ability. There's nothing physically overwhelming about number 36. He appears bigger in uniform because of a special pad which protects a separated shoulder that kept him benched the first half of his rookie year. Owen says that he began to lose confidence during this time, but his first appearance as a rookie runner erased all his or anyone else's doubts. He led his team to victory that night, and his career has been a one-way express to success ever since. Although he did little blocking and receiving in college, 
he quickly adapted to an expanded role in the prose. But the real story of Steve Owens lies in his relish of the inside running game, where each play, number 36, must meet and defeat men physically far his superior in a furious war of contact. On two, ready, break. 395, 395, hit! Here he comes. His is a story of violent, crushing confrontation. But living with the odds stacked against him is nothing new to Steve Owens. It's just a great challenge for me to, to be an inside runner because that's where all the people are. The punishment part of, of running inside is tough, but uh, I actually enjoy running inside. It's just the way I am. One thing is the way that I was I was brought up. came from a very large family, a very tough family. My father was a truck driver, and uh, it was tough coming all the way up in life. I think there's a lot more to it than uh, than a stopwatch or anything else. I think it's uh, if a guy has the heart to, to go out and play and want to play bad enough, he can do it. And I think this is my biggest asset. I really want to play football. And it would be difficult to play better football than Owens has demonstrated in the NFL. In 1971, he gained a 1,000 yards and became an all-pro. But Owens is not resting on his laurels. I've rushed for 1,000 yards, but right now that's, that's history. Uh, I want to do better. I want to I gain more yards. I want to play better. Those are my goals, to, to, to play on a winning football team and a championship football team. His records of the past, history. His goals for the future, clearly drawn. Steve Owens has literally fought his way to the realization of his dream. Due to his extraordinary collegiate career, Owens was given his shot within the plush locker rooms and confines of the NFL. For others, more obscure. Their lots sometimes led them to the purgatory of the minor football leagues. There, under spiritually squalid conditions, the closest most men get to the pros is wearing their discarded uniforms. But one man who did make it was number 38, Bob Tucker of the New York Giants. Bob had played college ball at tiny Bloomsburg State. Their football was merely a Saturday afternoon's diversion. Anything but a football factory. Even the cross-country squad got equal billing with the football team. Due to the caliber of competition, Bob was overlooked by pro scouts and wound up with the Pottstown Firebirds. There, Bob set league receiving records one year and bettered them the next. But after he had blown a chance for the Philadelphia Eagles, Bob had a career decision to make. I don't know what I was feeling. I felt I was capable of playing in the National League, and I didn't want to give up on it right away. But then again, I thought, well, what's the use if I, if I didn't make it this year when I felt I should have? Uh, I felt the people around me felt I should have. Uh, uh, why try again? But then again, I figured, well, I think I want to give it at least one more shot. And New York was the shot. One more shot, the New York Giants. Fabled Yankee Stadium and Bob Tucker, former Pottstown Firebird, raced out to discover the end of his rainbow. The year was 1970, and Bob never stopped running as he became a star for the Giants and came real close to becoming the NFL's Rookie of the Year. Bob Tucker was a sensation, living a dream suddenly come true. Behind Bob, through both the good and the bad, was one person who had never lost faith in his ability to make it. That person was Bob's wife, Lorraine. Well, the physical qualities that I think help Bob in his football profession are, of course, his physical blessings or endowments. He's big, he's strong, and he has the ability to endure pain. And this is something I don't like to think about too much, but he, uh, I know he gets knocked around and he can come back and God love him, but he's a real strong man. 
In 1971, in only his second year, Bob Tucker became the first tight end in NFL history to win the NFL receiving title. He caught 59 passes. Despite his nouveau fame and fortune, Bob Tucker has never forsaken his past. My whole career, really, I owe to the minor football leagues. If it wasn't for the Potsdam Firebirds, uh, the Lowell Giants, why, I wouldn't be playing where I am today. This league gave me the opportunity to keep playing, even though I wasn't recognized uh, by the major scouts. But Bob Tucker never cowered when faced by adversity, and that's why today he's a star in the NFL. It was during a George Allen free agent tryout day that one of the most improbable passages to the NFL took form. A certain Herb Mulkey turned in a 4540, but number 47's curiously hyphenated last name was not going to help him be remembered. Well, I've had the hyphen in my name since I was a junior in high school, and I had it legally done when I was in the service back in 70. And uh, it was because of the pronunciation of my name. People will look at it, M-U-L-K-E-Y, and call it all kind of ridiculous names. There was a guy named um, Malevi out here or some name like that. Any of you guys know him? All right, come back, come back. He ran 4-5 this morning. You know which one he is? His name is Mooney or Money or... There's one guy we're definitely bringing him to training camp. Oh, his name is Malevi. He ran a 4-5. Jesus. This Mulkey, I'd like to have you sign him today, if, you know, without putting too much pressure on, so he ends up asking for a, a bonus. But he's a, he's a good-looking kid, sir. Suddenly, Herb Mulkey was on his way to college for the first time. But on a team noted for not keeping its college stars, Herb's chances were somewhere between slim and none. But Mulkey was not intimidated by the enormity of his goal. He pushed himself to the limit, dreading each new cut list. And when others rested, Mulkey continued to drive himself. Herb knew that he was dealing with the biggest chance of his life. When the final cut came, there was no hyphenated name on it. For Herb Mulkey had carved out a berth for himself on the Redskins football team. Herb's first start came against the Bills, and he ripped them up. It was against Buffalo that he scored his first NFL touchdown. He started the following week in Dallas, where Doomsday looked downright silly when Herb carried the ball. Washington Redskins went on to win the NFC East title, and before he knew it, Herb Mulkey was fielding kickoffs in Super Bowl VII. His chances had been a million to one, but with feet flying, Herb had turned a Cinderella-like vision into a reality. In one season, he had gone from being a what's-his-name in a one-day tryout to become one of the leading kickoff return men in the NFL. For Mulkey, Owens, and Tucker, the crowds are part of the magnetism of the game, but that was not the case for Bonnie Sloan. For Bonnie Sloan is a deaf mute, but he's also an excellent football talent. And Sid Hall of the St. Louis Cardinals 
recognized his potential. The St. Louis Cardinals needed defensive linemen desperately. And uh, as a coach, what you look at is it's supply and demand. We're on a team that needs defensive help, defensive line help. Uh, we don't look at Bunny as being deaf. We look at Bunny as strictly a fine football prospect. If he can perform on the field, that's the only way we can judge him. And that's just exactly what he can do. He can perform. And actually, I think the challenge was more to us than it was to Bunny, because we knew he was a pro football player. He's big, he's fast, he's quick, he's tough, he's dedicated. It was our challenge then to be able to communicate with Bunny, to be able to get our ideas and our techniques over to him. We had to, to communicate with him so that he could reach his goal. When we communicate with Bunny on the field, it's the same as the classroom. We have to be facing him. Sometimes we forget and yell at him like we would <laughs> most of the players. And of course, he can't hear us. So we have to be in front of him. Our middle linebacker calls our defensive signals in the huddle. And of course, he's learned now to face Bunny. And this, of course, Bunny can pick up through lip reading. In our audible systems, we've designed and worked out with help from his college coaches, hand signals that indicate uh, certain line changes, uh, line stunts, uh, certain maneuvers that we uh, do outside the huddle. As a football player, being in a, in, a, in a silent world, you could get no outside emotional help like a crowd would do for most players. I think it's a very emotional thing to a player to hear the great roar running out to be introduced at football games with 50, 100,000 people cheering and not being able to hear it. Uh, it would get a lot of people down being in a silent world like this. But drawing from a deeper well of spirit than most of us can comprehend, Bonnie Sloan fought for and won a place in the NFL. Bonnie Sloan has one great thing that most great football players have to have. He has a great sense of desire to play and a great sense of pride. He's one of the hardest working people we have on our football team, and this is what it takes to be a good football player. Even if Bonnie wasn't deaf, he would still have this goal. He's that rare breed that he has one goal in his life, and that's to play pro football. In 1968, a free agent named Manny Fernandez was given a tryout on the then lackluster Miami Dolphins. It was believed that a Spanish-speaking player would appeal to Miami's large Cuban population. However, Manny did not speak Spanish, and as just another free agent, his chances of making it were poor. But he worried, worked, and won himself a job. And on opening day, number 75 was a starter. At 6'2", 240, Fernandez was small by defensive tackle standards but he has been the Dolphins' defensive lineman of the year for five consecutive seasons. His talent lies in his inspirational hustle and agility. With Manny as their defensive cornerstone, the Dolphins built a dynasty that now includes three Super Bowl appearances. But it was in Super Bowl VII that Manny Fernandez fulfilled every player's dream. He played his greatest game on football's biggest day and led his team to their first world championship. By taking a closer view of that Super Bowl, we can see a microcosm of the sport itself. In doing so, the ideal behind the men of this film comes most vividly into focus.